Do you want a dream home but can't afford to buy one? Well, you can have your dream and save cash by transforming a smaller, cheaper house. And that's exactly what our two families are planning. They want to massively increase their space for a fraction of what it would cost to buy their unaffordable dream home. It has been a bit of a nightmare, you know, how am I going to get this done in the time scale that I've allowed? I'm with the Turners in Christchurch, Dorset, who went hunting for a house and found a location. We first came and viewed this property. We didn't actually come into the house, we went straight down the garden, and as soon as we got to the bottom of the garden, that was it. We were buying the house. They need to dramatically extend their small 1930s house. It was always our intentions to, if we could, double the size of the property and make a family home. But first, I'm off to Whitstable on the Kent coast, where Maureen Shaw wants to transform her bungalow. Maureen bought it 18 months ago and now aims to create a home by the sea for her extended family to enjoy. Your kids grow up and they move on and what have you, but I still like the idea, and it's perhaps around Christmas, that they'll come home. I love having lots of people around. Maureen has only £50,000 to spend, but her carpenter son, Arby, has agreed to run the whole build by himself. It's a huge undertaking for him. This is for Mum. This is, this is for the greater good, you know, this is for the family, really. I'm meeting Maureen and Arby down the road from her bungalow to see the type of property she dreams of owning. Is this the style of house that you like? Yeah, definitely. Architecturally, I think it's less cluttered. I see the inside space as being less cluttered, and I just like that. I think it, I, it, it's where I'm at. This house would cost about half a million pounds to buy, and you bought your house for 190,000? Yeah. You wouldn't really be able to afford to buy this done. You want to no, create... No, I couldn't. No, there's no way I could afford to buy this like this. No way. So here are the sums. Maureen would need to find £360,000 to move to her dream house, but she has a budget of £50,000. Since she wants to increase the size of her bungalow by 150%, this is a very tight budget. And you're going to build it for her? It looks that way. Yeah. Brilliant. What a good son. Maureen's house is small, but bungalows can be great properties to expand dramatically. When you've got a good-sized plot, but with only a single-storey house on it, i.e. a bungalow on it, it's not surprising that people think about going up and converting the loft, like this house over here has done. And indeed, this house over here is two storeys. So when I look at this bungalow, what I see is potential. Right now, Maureen's bungalow can't accommodate family visits. On the ground floor, the cramped kitchen and tiny dining room aren't big enough for Maureen to entertain in. The rundown conservatory is a large waste of space. And she'll definitely need more than the current two bedrooms when they all come to stay. Compared to a lot of houses, especially considering this is single storey and not a very big house, there's a lot of space. It's a big hallway. And I know this was built later, but you come out here and there's this really big room out here. We would have this and that amazing garden. Transforming this space is a major part of the dream of big family get-togethers. I'd expect that my daughter and husband would be here, my younger daughter would be here, perhaps with work, work, with, a, work with a boyfriend. Arby and his girlfriend will be here, her son, Alfie, and whoever else might be around. So the more the merrier. Oh, definitely. The plan is to extend her bungalow upwards and outwards and more than double her living space. The conservatory will be rebuilt as a garden room next to an open-plan kitchen and dining room with a modern carport outside. In the new upstairs, they'll gain more bedrooms and bathrooms, ideal for the visiting family. It's a huge amount of work for 50 grand, and when you look at the plans, some things just don't make sense. Tell me about this bit. This is where the garage is now, is yeah, that right? Yeah, yeah, and that's going to be a carport, as you can see. What we want to do is cantilever some big steelwork to create a, a floating corner, giving a little bit of an enclosed feeling to that car area there. Creating a carport is a little bizarre. It'll eat into their incredibly tight budget, plus it'll take space from the living room. Why cantilever is so expensive in terms of engineering? I believe a better idea would be to extend her lounge and lose the carport. If they do this, they'll need to reapply to the planning department. 
I found Sarah's feedback valuable. The carport thing, that's what we've got permission for, that's what the council have granted, so our hands may be tied. More in Arby are certainly not making life easy for themselves, with a huge self-build and a tiny budget. Whilst it's admirable that Arby wants to do all of the work himself, it's easy to get overwhelmed and let the schedule and the budget slip. And that could spell disaster and the end of this family's seaside dream. Over in Dorset, the Turners couldn't afford to buy a big enough house in their dream area. A four-bedroom house here could cost between £500,000 and £600,000. And with all Christchurch has to offer, it's not difficult to see why. It's close to the beach, it's close to the New Forest, it doesn't get much better than Christchurch. But set on their dream, they bought a 1930s detached house for £270,000 and are building a two-storey rear extension. They couldn't afford the £280,000 it would cost them to buy a bigger house. So instead, they have £60,000 to extend this one. We've got the lovely plot, the views, the river, the garden, um, and, and the next stage is a really crucial stage for us. The Turners are storming ahead with making their detached house bigger. They're extending the living room to the rear of their property. And upstairs, they have added two bedrooms and an ensuite. But whilst building twice the amount of space in only 10 weeks, they seem to have made a rather basic mistake. It's not something that, that occurred to us until we were actually stood in it. With much of the building work complete, the Turners discover they have missed something out most of us would want in. Windows. I'm in the cave. <laughs> oh, this is dark. <laughs> The main problems that we have now that the build is nearly complete is lighting primarily. No windows means no natural light in the dining area or the new study. Ding. But they've nearly spent their £60,000 budget. Why well, would we build a house with no windows in? But it seems that's exactly what we've done. <laughs> we need Sarah, I reckon. Paul and Judith have hit a brick wall with their extension. They've already spent 45,000 of their 60,000 pound budget on structural work alone, and they've still got to fit a kitchen, bathroom, and make the space actually work for them. Thanks very much, bye. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> what an amazing garden with that beautiful, beautiful river. How would your dream home be when it's finished? My dream home would reflect the outside. That's what we're attempting to do with this house, is to bring the garden inside. So light, airy, open, spacious. The cave-like interior of the Turner's extension couldn't be further from the light-filled dream house they hoped they were building. Paul and Judith's two-storey rear extension means they've been able to move the living room to the back of the house and the kitchen to the front. They've also created a new study in the old kitchen space next to the dining area. Upstairs, they've moved two of the three existing bedrooms into the new extension to make room for a new family bathroom and ensuite for the master bedroom. What has gone wrong here is not actually as uncommon as you might think. The problem is the original house stopped here, so you had light from the front into the front room and then light from the back into the back room. But effectively, you've kind of created a tunnel by making what was a, a small house with windows at either end a much, much longer house with windows at either end. So in the middle of the tunnel, it's yeah. a tunnel. <laughs> in some ways, I can understand why you'd have taken your eye off the ball. It's because you're concentrating we on did. that We so did. Much. We concentrated on that completely. And, yeah, we didn't really pay much attention to this part of the house, I think. Paul and Judith may have dismissed obvious places to put windows, but there's often a clever way around it. Here, you've got a chimney breast in the middle, haven't we you? We have, yeah. On the outside, yes. so you can't put a window right in no. the middle. But you could put two taller windows to inside. either side of that. It's always more expensive to retrofit windows, but if you do, you may need to send amended plans to the council for approval. Get a compliance certificate from a registered supplier and ensure you meet all the environmental standards. 
As well as creating a tunnel-like dining room with no windows, the Turners are also struggling a bit with the old kitchen, which is being turned into a study. This is temporarily the kitchen. We did have a vision in our heads of a little snug area with the, the leather chairs and the library, and that was all well and good until we actually built everything. <laughs> They've blocked up the old kitchen window as it looks into their new living room. But I think they may have been a bit too hasty. I would be tempted to put a window in, because I think the sight line down to the end of the garden mm. would be fantastic. And I think if you can get light from as many different directions as possible with a small room like this, it does make it feel bigger. So mm. I think this could be a great little room. While the Turner's new extension has given them far more living space, it's created huge issues with lighting. Now is the moment to tackle the problem, or they'll bitterly regret it. I'm with two families aiming to save lots of cash by creating far more space for a fraction of the cost of buying. And we're showing you that you need less than you might think to afford your dream home. In Kent, the Shaw family is building their seaside dream. Son Arby has a relaxed managing style. I hadn't got a concrete schedule set in stone. But he's also got a small budget. And in Dorset, Paul and Judith are getting twice their living space with a £60,000 rear extension. But whilst they've nearly finished the build, windows are few and far between. Effectively, you've kind of created a tunnel by making a small house with windows at either end a much, much longer house with windows at either end. The problem for Paul and Judith is how to stretch the £15,000 left of their £60,000 budget to finish the build and get light in. So I'm taking them to check out this light-filled Victorian terrace, which should give them some ideas that won't burn their finances. This house has been designed specifically with light in mind. It's actually got the same sort of problems that your house has. Some of it might be quite inspiring for you to, to bring light in. Natural light is that far more important as opposed to flicking a switch. Natural light is much better if you can get it for lots and lots of reasons. It's a much nicer light anyway to live with. How light or dark your house is depends on which way it's facing. If you aren't lucky enough to have a sun-trapped south-facing property, then you need to think big when it comes to glass. The reason they put so much glass on this side is because this is west-facing, because if it was south-facing, it would be incredibly hot. If you look here, there's a window that's against a wall, and then you look further up at the window that's against the, the sky, and it brings a lot more light in. You can also boost the effect of daylight at one end of the room by installing clever, recessed artificial light throughout the rest of the space. It tricks the eye, really, into thinking that there's light in the middle of the house when actually there isn't. The architect has gone one step further and solved the problem of a gloomy hallway with a stroke of glassy genius. When you look up there, it's absolutely spectacular. The architects managed to get the light from the top of the house all the way down through this yeah, stairwell. I do now, like this. Now, clearly, this might be a bit too much in your house, but it's incredible to see what you can achieve with glass if you put your mind to it. Speechless. <laughs> <laughs> the glass roof panels and staircase here cost around £25,000, but there's a more affordable alternative that I'd like the Turners to consider. Sun tunnels pull in natural light through a specially designed reflective tube installed between your roof and ceiling. They're great for lighting gloomy spaces such as hallways and bathrooms. And they can be adapted to fit most roof types, whether yours is flat or pitched, with installation costs starting from around £1,000. Sun tunnels are a really good way of creating this effect. It's amazing really how similar this hallway and staircase and layout is to our own. And to have a sun tunnel at the top of the stairs Just would, would, would down, create exactly the same effect here, but in a slightly different way. It would be a great way to bring the hallway to life if you can bring daylight into it. There's lots of inspiring things here, but I think the important thing for Paul and Julia to take away is that they need to buy the right sized windows and they need to put them in the right positions. Sun tunnel might be a really good handy hint. For more information about this show or extending a house, check out my scrapbook 
at channel4.com forward slash Sarah. Over in Whitstable, Arby's in charge of totally transforming his mum's bungalow. Two weeks in, he has started on the block work, but I'm wondering whether he's decided to extend the family lounge or splash out on the carport. What have you decided to do? We have decided to go with your suggestions on losing the carport. Right, cool. It's a bit of a gamble because the council haven't given us uh, the approval yet. I'm not sure I'd recommend this to anyone. Getting retrospective planning permission is risky. You may be forced to take down what you've done. Bit of a punt, but... Um... Yes, you could say that. We are a little bit concerned, but all of the informal advice that we've been given points us in the direction to, to just go ahead and be proactive and take a bit of a risk, and we should get the approval that we're hoping for. So their plans for the ground floor now extend to a bigger lounge. And the links between the kitchen and the garden room will be great when the family visit. But with a whole new upper floor to build, Maureen and Arby have really got their work cut out. Yet progress on site seems to be slow as Arby is tied up doing work for other clients. It was always going to be a juggling act so that I can maintain an income. Because if I can't work, I can't pay the bills. I can understand why Arby wants to do as much as he can himself to save cash. But two months into this six-month build, I'm a bit worried that things are already starting to slip. And if that happens, Maureen's £50,000 budget is likely to be the first casualty. The problem with a site this big is that it can easily run away with you, so I just want to go and have a chat with them and make sure everything's OK. How are you? All right, how are you? Very well, nice thank to see you. you. You're seven weeks in, and I'm going to be really honest, you've got the, the slab laid, and that's sort of it. Do you have a, a schedule as to how long this project's going to take? We're hoping September to October we should get everything wrapped up. Initially, you were saying that you were hoping August. Mm. So now you're thinking September, October. You think your mum cares how long it takes? If it's a month or two over, she's not that bothered. If it's January, then she will be a bit bothered. Hi, how Hi. are you? I'm a bit worried the focus on this huge project is drastically drifting. I mean, have you talked about a schedule with RB? We, we haven't actually sat down and said, we want this to be finished by this time and this to be finished by that time. I'm a little bit concerned by the fact that there isn't a schedule in place mm -hmm. because I think the danger is that Arby's working to his schedule and you're in working to your schedule. And the reality is this isn't going to take 25 weeks if you carry on kind of making... It's slightly up as you go along, it'll take a year or two. There's no way, absolutely no way I want that to happen. <laughs> a project of this scale with no schedule is a recipe for disaster. Arby can't think like a one-man band. He needs to start planning for his mum's build and budget. Golden rule number one is to create a weekly schedule for the duration of the build. So next week we've got scaffolding going up, yep. haven't we? Rule number two is to block out each week so it's clear when each trade starts and finishes. This will help you to book trades and deliveries at the right point, saving time and money. And then we're talking about the, the timbers go on, the roof timbers. This way you'll know pretty quickly, yeah. you won't get to week 21 and think, crikey, we seem to be totally, totally behind. It might be helpful for us mm. to have a schedule that at least we kind of think, OK, just to help us in our planning and thinking ahead. We don't want it set in stone because then we're tying ourselves to something we might slip from or not meet. The goalposts may change, but at least you know they're changing rather than it all being a great big surprise. Arby took quite a lot of convincing that a schedule was a good idea, but writing it down certainly convinced me that it was incredibly tight, the schedule. What it really said loud and clear was that the big challenge now is trying to stick to it. I'm with two households aiming to massively increase their space without breaking the bank in the process. In Dorset, Paul and Judith are building twice their living space with a two-storey rear extension. I'm in the cave! <laughs> but in elongating the house, they unfortunately forgot to put in enough windows, plunging the dining room and the study in the middle section into darkness. 
why would we build a house with no windows in? But it seems that's exactly what we've done. <laughs> we need Sarah. Do you know what I'd be tempted to do? I, I would be tempted to put a window in. They've started to remedy the situation by thinking cleverly about where to position their windows. And we've been able to start shedding some light on their problem. I can see right the way down to the garden and it's let in twice the amount of light. Paul's also installing another window in the study's outside wall. How's it looking out there? Wow, look at that. Look at all the light that's coming into this room already. You couldn't see each other in this room uh, this time yesterday. Next door, in the tunnel-like dining room, two more windows are going in. All are being fitted as high as possible to catch the most daylight. Yeah, I like, yeah. It's made a big difference in this room, definitely. A lot of natural light coming in. And inspired by the house we saw in London, they're also installing two sun tunnels to light up the gloomy landing and hallway. But in Kent, things aren't looking so bright on Maureen and son Arby's ambitious self-build. Halfway through this six-month build, and still planning permission isn't in place to extend the lounge into the garage, but work is going on regardless. There's an awful lot of pressure sitting on Arby's shoulders to complete this build single-handedly on a budget of £50,000. For Maureen, one of the most important parts of the build is turning the rundown conservatory into a garden room for the family. So I'm taking them to a house that's integrated the living space with the garden, with stunning results. Now this is what I wanted to show you. Oh, this is a lovely space. That's an fantastic. amazing view over the garden, yes. Isn't that something? It's beautiful. The things I really wanted to show you were some of the details that mm. they've used here. The floorboards are laid in the same direction inside as the decking is laid outside. What it does that is it pulls your eye down the floor, out onto the decking and down into the garden. So everything is forcing you to look yeah. down the garden. Another trick to bring the garden into the living space is to reflect it wherever you can. Avoid dark, matte finishes. Instead, go for light, glossier surfaces that bounce reflections around the room. A lot of the surfaces reflect the garden, so you'll see the green reflected in the unit. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about the reflective surfaces everywhere? Yeah, I just love the idea of being so close to the garden. I love that. It really illustrates what I've had in my mind for a long time. It is very inspiring, actually. Mm. So this is inspiring? It's the difference between carrying things around in your head and seeing something in the way that you're kind of envisaging it's mm. going to be. So seeing something like this really kind of think, yeah, yeah, it's, it's doable. Yeah, that's awesome. That just speaks volumes, doesn't yeah. it? It's great to see Arby and Maureen excited and positive, especially Maureen because this is all about her dream vision. So while Arby focuses on the outside of the build, I'm hoping to catch up with Maureen about her plans for the family kitchen. Do you have a strong vision in your mind as to how it's going to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do? You yeah. see it exactly? Yeah, pretty much. So with some technical wizardry, I can show Maureen what her plans will really look like. Wow, yeah, that's just about it. But seeing it like this reveals a possible problem. Tucked away in the corner is the family dining table a bit of a waste of those gorgeous garden views. I think the danger with your design as it is, is that you'll cook and you'll eat in this hole in the middle of the house, and actually you'll be like a little mole inside, in the middle of this lovely, beautiful house with amazing views over a garden, but instead of being near the views into the garden, you're going to be hidden away in the middle of the house in a room with no windows. Another solution would be to move the table to the garden room to make the most of the views and free up the kitchen wall for lots more storage. If you did it like this, you'd have a load more storage all the way down that wall. Mm -hmm. And then you could have the table and chairs in there mm -hmm. and you have the sofas mm -hmm. in there. You will spend 99% of your waking day mm -hmm in the conservatory, overlooking that beautiful garden. I do like the idea of looking over the garden. I think it would make a really nice dining room. 
Yeah, I mean, it's growing on me by the minute. <laughs> yeah, I think it's cool. Arby is determined to help Maureen create her perfect family home. They were six before blocks, weren't they? However, balancing her projects and his work elsewhere is stretching him to the limits. Right this moment in time, I'm really stressed with it. Hi, it's uh, Arby. Just, uh, just wanted to go. It's been an extremely difficult last month trying to juggle my private finances and my private work with enough time on this. It's been a bit of a nightmare, you know, how am I going to get this done in the time scale that I've allowed? Still, despite all his hard work, the build is behind. And there's another problem looming. 1.7 tonnes of support steels for the first floor need to be hoisted carefully into position. We've got the crane for the whole morning, but we've only got two components to move, so hopefully I've done all the prep work. It should be pretty straightforward. Fingers crossed. But as the crane operator checks the site, a potentially life-threatening problem becomes apparent. With over 11,000 volts being carried by the overhead power lines, that crane can't do anything. You're not allowed to go across power lines, and if you do, if you touch them, then it's uh, as catastrophic consequences. Sadly, RB didn't see this coming. This oversight means the next stage can't progress, pushing the build even further off schedule. So we're already a week behind. Looks like it's going to be another five days on top of that, because we can't get him back until next Thursday. So, yeah, a bit knocked off, but what can you do? One of those things, you just got to suck it up. I really feel for Arby. There's pressure on all sides to stick to the £50,000 budget, to stick to the schedule and to hold down his job. I know from experience what it's like to juggle too much and sometimes something's got to give. We're just not going to get it weatherproof and, and you know, ready for, for the winter at the current rate. And I think what I need to do is actually wind back all the, all the paying work and maybe get a bit of help in as well. Obviously, I am thinking about the budget, but it does make sense, and I can see exactly where, you know, where you're coming from, so we've just got to do it. Well, that's a relief. I was a bit worried about this conversation, but I'm, I'm glad that you agree, and I think, really, it's the only way to do it. It's the only way to go. Yeah, it makes sense to me. With Arby now able to concentrate full-time on the project and pay for extra labour, the build finally swings back into life. There are a lot more people around now, and it's gone from being a fairly quiet site to suddenly, yeah, there's, there's roofers, there's bricklayers. So, yeah, things are, are moving apace. With the first floor and roof going up and the internal walls coming down, this bungalow's transformation is well underway. What we're, what we're going to be doing the next sort of day or two really marks the end of the bungalow and the birth of, of, of Mum's house. And then the architect arrives with something Arby's been waiting for. Arby. Hello. I've got some uh, news. I've got the planning approval. Formal written approval. Yeah. Thank you very much. There you are. Oh, I'm going to have to frame that. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's a little cherry on top. That's great. I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a positive, another positive. Please, please with that. It's a great relief to get approval for the plans to replace the costly carport. If it hadn't come through, though, they could have been forced to take down one side of the house and part of the roof. Arby has learnt a lot on this project, and I'm getting more and more excited to see the results. Over in Dorset, Paul and Judith's eight-month project is almost finished. This has been a bit of a rescue job, but I'm hoping they've managed to turn their cave-like interior into the amazing space they've always wanted. How are you? 
Good to see you. By adding a rear extension, they turned their 1930s house into a long, dark tunnel. But by adding more windows in the dining room, the gloomy tunnel has been turned into a bright, light-filled space. How fantastic. What a difference. That's amazing. To think this was that long, thin, dark tunnel and now this central part of the house has really come to life. Having natural daylight in here has made all the difference in the world, hasn't it? I wouldn't have thought that two smallish windows would have had quite the effect that it has in this room. It's, it's made a dramatic difference. We've put them as high up as possible to try and get as much daylight in as possible, and that's a south-facing wall as well, so we do get an awful lot of light in here now. Now, this space, you've got light coming in from the back, light coming in from the front, and light coming in from the side, which means that the whole of this space now works and there's a flow to it. Is this what you imagined you were going to end up with in here? This, this is far better than I imagined. I mean, we've got, you know, 25% extra space downstairs now because it's a room we now use, whereas we just walked through before. So it's all of that and more, and it's a lovely room. I'm really impressed. It really works well. Next door, they've turned the old kitchen into a study. Whilst initially they blocked up the window as it looked into their new living room, they decided to replace it with a smaller window and added another to the side wall. And the study is now flooded with natural light. Amazing to think that this was once that absolutely tiny, dark little kitchen. Yes, my little cave. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Amazing the difference that this window makes, because you now have sight lines going right the way down the garden. It's transformed the house with the depth that it now gives with this window going into the lounge and looking down the garden. The house that we visited with you, where you got the idea of bringing daylight in from both ends and sort of channeling it through the house, that helped us to see that it really does work. And um, we're really pleased with it. Now it's got light that's stolen from the sitting room, light that's stolen from the front door, and its own light, even though it's north facing, because it's high up and a big wide window really pulls the light in. It's such a nice room. Upstairs, the landing used to be little more than a dingy cut-through to the bedrooms. But they've even managed to bring light in here, too. Brilliant. The sun tunnels. They work brilliantly, don't they? They've made a dramatic difference to the light up here. I was quite surprised how much light they do actually bring in. And not only do they bring natural daylight in, which is what you want rather than having to use artificial light, but also there's no electricity cost on running them. That's free natural daylight. It's another area we avoided. We just walked through this. It was just access to the bedrooms, but it's more than access to upstairs now. It's a, a place that is functional but pleasing as well, and, and it's a place that we use. The house we went to look at, they'd obviously done something very magnificent with removing all the stairs and landings, but this is a, a rather more affordable and practical solution for this space and a really good interpretation of what they've done. I think what you've done really, really well here is you've linked the house together with daylight. So this space here would have been quite a dark landing. Instead, you've got the sun tunnels, which pulls your eye down towards the window here and then down to the front door. So you're pulling light around and stealing it from every direction. It's really good. I have to hand it to Paul and Judith. They've done a brilliant job. But have they managed to do all this for a fraction of the cost of buying that dream house? Paul and Judith couldn't afford the £280,000 they needed to buy their dream house. But by spending a total of £65,000, they've now got twice their living space for less than half the cost of moving. This is a story about light. Whether you beg, borrow or steal it, it is the key to creating the perfect home. This salvage operation has really shown Paul and Judith how just a few thoughtfully placed windows and clever light solutions can have a massive impact on both the value of your home and your life.
18 months ago, Maureen Shaw bought a neglected 1960s bungalow in Whitstable. She wanted to more than double its size and create a seaside getaway that would be the heart of her family. Your kids grow up and they move on and what have you, but I still like the idea, and it's perhaps around Christmas, that they'll come home. I love having lots of people around. Her carpenter son, Arby, was keen to help her construct this dream. With a budget of £50,000, the plan was for him to do as much of the work as possible to save her cash. But as the bill progressed, he realised he'd taken on too much. If we want to get this wrapped up before the winter, I'm going to need to get a bit of help in as well. I can see exactly where you're coming from, so we've just got to do it. With more help and RB freed up to manage the projects, so that, so that off. the bill steps up a gear. This was a hugely ambitious project for Arby. He had no experience of running a project of this scale, and there are times when I thought it would all spiral out of control. But he's finished, and I'm dying to see what it looks like. Before, this was a typical 1960s bungalow. In a great location, but perhaps not that beautiful to look at. Now it's a stunning seaside retreat, with crisp render set off against striking vertical cladding and modern aluminium windows. This house will give the family pleasure for years to come. Hi, hello, how are you? Hi, Sarah. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hello, hi, hello. how are hello. you? Very well. Good, good. What an amazing transformation. What did you do with the bungalow? It's disappeared. <laughs> Are you proud of what you've achieved here? Not yet. I don't know. I'm, well, you I'm, jolly well should be. I'm... Uh... Are you proud of him? I think <clears> it's amazing. I cannot get over what Arby and the guys that have worked with him have done. I think it's amazing. I look at it and I think if I was him standing here, I would be swollen with pride. It's flipping beautiful, I've got to say. That is completely gorgeous. I'm dying to see inside. The rear of the property was a rickety lean-to, a dead space used mainly for storage. Now it's a stunning light-filled garden room with modern bifold doors that seamlessly brings the garden into the house. Ideal for sitting back, relaxing and enjoying the view. And inspired by the trip we made together, they laid the decking and floorboards running the same way. And here you've got the infinity decking going into the flooring in here, which is fabulous. Because the outside decking and the inside flooring all run in the same direction, it pulls the eye from the garden all the way through the house. So this fantastic sight line is so effective. Yeah. Bearing in mind, it was quite a lot based around the garden and pulling outside, yeah, inside, inside, outside. Mm. You have, as much as you could, rub the line between inside and outside out, you have done that. Before, the kitchen and dining room didn't work for Maureen's entertaining. Now, the space is cleverly designed to lead you naturally towards the hub of the home, Maureen's kitchen. She has a large dining area combined with a contemporary kitchen that's perfect for big family gatherings. This here is what you wanted as the heart of the home, isn't it? It was really important to you that you should be able to have a home where your family could congregate and all yeah. three of your children would be able to feel that they could come back mm. to. I, I want to, to, for my kids to still be able to come home, as it were. I still kind of think I want to do Christmas. <laughs> and having a kitchen like this to do it in would be fantastic. I'll be starting next week getting ready for Christmas. <laughs> We don't actually have a home that, that any of us have got that could really seat or house all of us. Well, now we've got that, you know. It's not cramped and we're not uncomfortable. And we've just got more room here to be the people in the family that we are and, and to function normally. And there's another idea from the house we visited they put to brilliant use. You've done a really great job because you've got reflective surfaces. You see the garden mm. bounced back all over the place. I'm really pleased with, with even the, the gloss units in the kitchen and the mirrors here and there. And it just adds dimension, it adds sight, it, it tricks the eye into, into, into making it feel even bigger. 
Maureen decided not to move the main dining area into the light-filled garden room, but she's found a compromise that works well for her. So you decided to not put cabinets along here, but also put a table mm. over in the window. So mm. the table there will be a lovely place to sit and really appreciate the garden. Yeah, yeah. I felt putting cabinets down that wall, it might end up looking like an industrial kitchen. I, I think what we've done really is kind of combine some of your suggestions with some of my, I can be stubborn. <laughs> When I first met Arby, he was planning to build a carport out of cantilevered steels at the front of the house. Sensibly, he ditched it in favour of a larger lounge. I can't wait to see how it turned out. So, you look at this, what an enormous room. It's pretty big, isn't it? It's worked yeah. out well. How do you feel it would be if you had kept the carport and hadn't made the room bigger? The proportions were, were, were never attractive. It was, it was a rectangle. Mm. So now that we've got this space, it's kind of made it, it, it it's much better proportioned than it was before. It would have looked good, and, and from a design point of view, with the cantilevered first floor, it could have been an interesting feature, albeit a little bit of an expensive folly. Mm. But really, this, this makes more sense, mm. a bigger lounge and a, and a more straightforward structural process of building it. This is a beautiful room. Though Arby did take a risk starting work on it before they got planning permission, the extra space is worth it. We had to proceed. If, if we'd waited, it would have held us up four to five weeks. So we just went ahead and built it and hoped for the best. And it was a big day when the architect dropped off the, the, the actual formal notice. It was an educated gamble. And, and, mm. and it paid off, thank goodness. Fortunately, yeah. Upstairs, by adding a whole new floor, they've created a large master bedroom with ensuite. In addition, Maureen has two attractive guest rooms and a new bathroom. Plenty of room for her family to be comfortable when they come to visit. It can be tricky mixing family with business, but Arby and Maureen have worked well together. The question is, did keeping it in the family pay off? So the initial budget was £50,000, and, and how much did you end up spending? 135. 85,000 pounds is a lot of extra money to find. How, how did you find that? Family, friends and the bank. A lot of the money towards the end of the project actually went on additional resources because we just had to claw that schedule mm. back. At the outset, we weren't quite so fixed on an end date. Your input with the schedule really clarified what extra resources we'd need to bring in to meet things. If you had got a main contractor to do this job, it would have been likely to cost you £200,000. So whilst it's a lot more than you are originally hoping to spend, £135,000 is a lot less than I think it would have cost. Ultimately, it's been a steep learning curve and you've learned a lot along the way, haven't you? The fundamental thing that's come out of this for me and, and the best advice I could ever offer anyone else is professional services at the outset. Get a good architect, quantity surveyor. You, you know, you, you can't cost a job like this as a layman. You need a professional. Looking at the figures in this, the bungalow's worth about £190,000 when you started out. Mm -hmm. And you could have gone down the road and bought your dream house, but that would have cost you about 550000 So you'd have needed to find another £360,000. 135000 is less than half what it would have cost you to go and buy a house of this spec. Would you have been able to find 360,000? No way. <laughs> Not a chance in hell. No. Nope. That's why, for me, it's worth every penny. Do the sums add up? Maureen couldn't afford the 360,000 pounds she needed to move to a larger dream house. Instead, she spent 135,000 pounds on increasing the size of her bungalow by 150% just over a third of the price of buying her dream house. That's not all. I reckon it would be quite reasonable to suppose that you would be able to sell it now for £420,000. So you've actually created £100,000 odd of equity in this house. That is exactly what I set out to do. When I said to Abby, um, how about doing this project? And he said, well, what will you make? And the figure I said was £100,000, wasn't it? If one of my sons grows up to be this useful, I'll be really pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> 
I really love what's happened here. There's something deeply heartwarming about the fact that Arby has created this fabulous home for his mother and the fact that this home will be the new focal point for the whole family. It's an amazing home. They've turned a humdrum bungalow into an incredible property and added a load of value to it along the way. It just goes to show what you can achieve when you think outside the box with a property.